two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello from the United Kingdom to the rest of the world. It's James Blatch and Mark Dawson on a Friday with the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. We hope you're having a great week. Mark and I are just discussing how calm it is. We've almost got nothing on, you and me, haven't we? Oh, it's it's so quiet. Yeah, it's so nothing cool. to do. That's English sarcasm because Mark is actually <laughs> exchanging contracts on his house today, which is, yeah. I mean, we have a strange, I don't know what it's like in the States. We have a strange system in the UK where it's so flaky. It can Everything can collapse at any moment. Yeah, it could do. Yeah, so I've been just to calm you. Yeah, hugely busy. So yeah, exchange today, and then um, normally you'd have a bit of a slightly more relaxed period where you'd you know take care of the uh, the bits and pieces that need to be taken care of in between this today and moving into the new house. But we've decided because you know we we don't mess around and we like a challenge. We're gonna we've only got two kids and a puppy. And we're going yeah. on holiday shit soon as well. We're gonna we're gonna do it in two weeks. So uh, yeah. I've been I've been running around a bit today, so yeah, there and you go. You're getting professional people in to do the moving, obviously. Oh no, no, do it myself. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, yeah. We oh, absolutely I, I will not be lifting a stick of furniture. No, no, quite right. So that's the best money you can ever spend. I've made that yes. mistake before. Um, well, good luck, good luck with the uh, the move. It is a stressful time, and uh, we're in the middle of um, doing some a lot of coursework at the moment. So Stuart Bache's uh, course, which I mentioned last week, is out in beta at the moment. So we've got three or four people who are doing that course. Um, have we set a price? For that, can we announce Not that? Yeah. Not yet. Okay, so let's just have a, a further think about that, and um, the final tweaks will be made. Then transcripts and captions, and it'll look polished and neat, and then that will go up for sale. And it's going to be the first time we just sit uh, as an evergreen course, as mm-hmm. they say. So yeah. that's quite exciting. Um, We are talking, so funny enough, how busy we are, and uh, this week is not without anxieties for you and me, and um, I've struggled to get out and do some exercise. I went for a brief run yesterday, but uh, we are going to be talking about the healthy writer, and this is not just a sort of faddy thing. It's a really important uh, aspect of our lives that we need to think about, and uh, we've got none other than Joanna Penn from The Creative Pen who's going to come on and talk about that in a moment, and she's been brilliant. She's doing bit of a transformation at the moment and, and prioritizing her life and she's written a book uh, to go along with that so it's a really good interview and I would uh, urge you all to listen to it doesn't matter what your genre is or where you work in it it's important to look after yourselves uh, and uh, for the long haul here however before that and sort of an un- slightly related theme in terms of looking after yourselves and looking after um, the community we have a member of our SPF community who needs our help uh, Mark do you want to talk about Tommy yeah, sure. So uh, Tommy Dombavand is um, has been writing for quite a long time. Uh, he he has worked for um, at certainly the Beano, I think, and the Dandy potentially. So those are very well known comics from like the golden age of comics. You know, the forties and fifties, maybe even earlier than that in the UK. He's written for Doctor Who. Um, he's published some some self publishing stuff, and you know, I've been I've I've known him online for a little while, um, and. I, a couple of years ago, I guess I'm not entirely sure of the, the time frame on this, but he was diagnosed with, um, I think, stage four throat cancer um, some time ago. And Tommy's got he's married, he's got two young sons, um, and he he I think it was you know there were it was touch and go. There was a moment I think when um, he contracted some um, had some some other elements as well, and the doctors told his wife that he had a couple of hours to live if he didn't respond to the treatment, and he, he did. Um, he lost 13 stone, or he's lost 13 stone, I think, since being ill. But he fought back and um, was able to, to beat the throat cancer. But then before Christmas, uh, just, just gone, um, he noticed um, a, a very large lump on the side of his face. And he went to the doctors, worried that it was the cancer. The doctor said, um, that's part, that's kind of a, a to do with your previous cancer. It's not cancerous. But unfortunately, you, you have got a growth in your lung. So he now faces the situation where he has um, lung cancer. So this pisses me off, um, let, let, let's be honest. Um, people might remember a friend of mine had um, a breast cancer last year, Emma, and we raised, or she raised um, 50 or 60,000 pounds, more than that probably. And quite a lot of that came from um, my audience and, and, and a very large slice of it came from the SPF audience as well. So I said to Tommy last night, have you thought about just giving page and i think 
Tommy is probably one of those people um, who is a little bit reluctant to put his hand out and ask for help. Um, but he has put a page together and I really want to, to get behind that and, and help him because he, he can't work now. He, he makes money from going to schools and telling them about writing and comics and things like that. So I, I want to help him. I, I'm going to do, donate to him. In fact, by the time this goes out, I will have donated to it. I think um, the, uh, James and John um, and, and Lucy from SPF, we are also going to donate to it as well. I'm going to put a message in the SPF community. I'm going to contact my fans. Um, and I would really love us to be able to give Tommy a little bit of help because it's a, it's a, it's just awful. I, I, I hate it. Yeah. Um, and after fighting so hard to, to beat the, the first cancer to then come down with news like this is just, just the worst. So um, this is, yeah, this is my, a little, sounds a bit grandiose, but it's a little project. I really want to, to do what I can and, and what we can do to, to help Tommy uh, get back on his feet again. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, Mark. And uh, reading through the description Tommy's written on his page, and I'm going to give the URL in just a second, um, you can tell, in fact, he says, I'm devastated. And you can tell that he's scared, uh, as you and I would be, anyone would be in that situation. Let's do everything we can to help Tommy uh, beat this and recover and carry on writing and carry on being a member of our community. So the place to go, it's a rather long URL. We'll put it up on the screen on YouTube and we'll put it in the show notes but it's justgiving.com forward slash crowdfunding forward slash Tommy Don Bavand. So Tommy Don Bavand is actually spelled as it sounds, which is Tommy T-O-M-M-Y-D-O-N-B-A-V-A-N-D. So justgiving.com forward slash crowdfunding forward slash Tommy Don Bavand. Do you know what we should do? Let's set up a, um, a redirect. John can do that. An SBS. Yes. So self publishing formula forward slash self publishing formula dot com forward slash Tommy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll set that up. So that's an easier one for you to remember. Self publishing formula dot com forward slash Tommy. Uh, that will take you to the page to to donate. Uh, yes. Uh, well, what can you say? I mean, you know, we glibly walk through life um, and uh, probably just take huge amounts of what we do every day and enjoy our time with our family and we take it all for granted of course we do because we're humans and every now and again you you read tommy's story and it just brings you up short uh, of what life can throw at you yeah yeah so let's let's all um let's see what we can do i'm i'm confident we can make a really positive difference and, and help him out great okay good good luck tommy i hope you're listening and we're going to do everything we can to help you out Right, before we get into the interview, uh, it's that time to welcome some new Patreon supporters to the podcast. So uh, we give a shout out to everybody who becomes a Patreon supporter. Mark's going to have a cough. Did that very well. Didn't know a thing. Um, There's a lot. And my pronunciation is going to be hilarious through this. So let's say hello and welcome to Al Denova, to Amber Bisecker, to Anthony Young, to B. Schrimmer, to Claire Delaney, uh, to Craig A. Hart, to Dana Killian, to Darla Lark, uh, David F. Behrens. Hmm, can we announce something about David F. Behrens? Should we announce we, that? Have we announced it? We haven't um, announced it, but we could announce it. Yeah, yeah, David is going to be, David applied for the first book lab, so we are currently um, taking one of his books to bits, and we will be podcasting about that quite soon. And uh, we'll, we'll do that another three times this year. So uh, all of these people James is reading now, if, if they're gold members, um, you are um, eligible to have, um, well, the, the team that we've put together look at your books and, and provide hopes and feedback that will help you um, and also the community because a lot of this stuff is universal. It'd be interesting, actually, if you if you look at David F. Behrens on Amazon. Um, I think it's Hat Check. Is that yeah. right? Hat Check, yes. I think, is the book that we've taken. So you can have a look at what's there now, read the look inside, and these are all the things that are going to be uh, taken apart by our experts um, very publicly shortly. Uh, let me carry on. Say hello to Emily DeMario and thank you. Uh, Holly Starkey, Jack Erickson, Jane Kennedy, Gemma Brown, Jennifer Morga, uh, John Majoris, uh, Kenneth Britz, uh, Night and Day Publishing. Night and Day Publishing, interesting uh, name. Uh, Lily Saint Germain, or Saint Germain, Saint Germain, uh, care of Jessica Roscoe, uh, Lucy Score, Melissa Banjak, uh, Nini Hammond. Hello, Nini. Uh, we've got Patricia D. Eddy, Pip Cody, Robert Thessman, Robert Clark, Ron Yarosh. Hello, Ron. Do you remember meeting Ron in Florida a couple of years of ago? I do. Uh, Rory Maron, 
Shannon Kuzmich. Shannon, of course, we met as well. Well, we uh, interviewed uh, Shannon uh, ahead of the 101 launch, I think. Uh, good luck to you, Shannon, who I think is in the middle of reassessing her writing. She's been an interesting journey, actually, Shannon. So she's obviously a, a writer. She wants to write. She wrote a family story, which are difficult. They are difficult to market, and I think she struggled with that. But she wants to write, so she's now taking a very practical approach, thinking, well, what genre shall I write in? And so she's getting some good advice in the group already. Well, what do you like reading? You know, mm. And uh, we can't wait to see Shannon moving forward with her career. Uh, Taryn Blackthorne, Thomas Fowler, Vanda Reiter, is that her name? Uh, William Tyler Davis. They are all our new uh, supporters on Patreon. And you can become a supporter on Patreon if you go to patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast. So thank you so much for supporting the podcast. It means a lot to Mark and myself. And uh, yes, and it keeps us going, doesn't it? So good. Right. Well, let's talk to Joe. And then I'm going to ask you what exercise you've done this week when we come back okay let's uh, let's talk to our friend joe about being a healthy writer so joe i think most people know who you are but just in case there's somebody who doesn't know who you are listening to this podcast should we do a recap of who joe stroke jf penn is Oh, thank you so much. So as Joanna Penn, I, I write nonfiction for authors and I have the Creative Pen podcast, which some listeners might know as JF Pen. I write thrillers and dark fantasy. And as Penny Appleton, I actually write a sweet contemporary romance. And I guess I'm a speaker and a blogger and all of that as well. Okay, and we're going to talk about, uh, I think, a sort of area of well-being um, in general terms for writers. Um, uh, in this interview but let's have a little catch up if you don't mind Joe because it's been a little while since you've been on so I know one of the exciting things you've been doing is some collaborative writing in fact in unusual places oh well yes in in 20 what is it 2017 last year uh a four of us got on a train in chicago and between chicago and new orleans we plotted out a book a dark fantasy novel and then we spent a week in new orleans writing that um and it's the i must say there are wonderful pros and terrible cons when it comes to co-writing and it's very very challenging especially with a narrative arc uh you know we took a character each and wrote four characters and but sewing them all together was a hell of a job and we only had a week to do it so that was a real challenge whereas the other co-writing I've done so with Jay Thorne when we did Risen Gods with my mum for Penny Appleton and with the healthy writer oh actually the healthy writer we did we alternated chapters but generally I have a consistent voice with my co-writers um, and what was so funny with uh, American Demon Hunters uh, sacrifice was there was no way we were going to get a consistent voice between me and Lindsay Baroka, who writes just massively long fantasy books, and Jay and Zach. So that was that was great fun. But I, I actually think that collaboration is a huge trend in the indie publishing movement. So I'm really glad to be doing more of it myself. Yeah, we did speak to Jay about this. It sounded like a great episode. Now, you, you just said that you did the, I obviously talk, talked about this with Jay, I'm trying to throw my mind back, but you did the character arcs. I can understand fleshing out the characters individually and then coming together. I'm not sure how four of you separately plan an arc of a character without constantly talking to each other about the story. Well, I mean, as in the arc of the story. So we plotted the story, but what we didn't want was a repetition of the same story from different point of views. So it's like, here's my character, Sebastian, in the um, in a carriage. And we actually wrote it. The, the story itself is set on the train from Chicago to New Orleans. So it's very meta. Um, but basically, you know, the point of view is with Sebastian, my character, and then the skull rolls out the door and then it's with another character. So instead of following Sebastian it's more like a visual you know like 24 where you would zoom into a new character's point of view but the narrative arc remains the same whereas some novels written from multiple points of view might tell the same episode from different angles so that I think that's what made it work yes but you obviously did have to do a fair amount of um, actual collaboration as well as working by yourself in your room for to to get this together yeah, we did. And well, and that's that was the beauty of all being together in New Orleans was actually we were meeting twice a day. And um, because I had jet lag, which is a real bonus when you're flying west to America, you know, um, I was up really early. So I got my words in before anybody else. And then they had to listen to me. <laughs> yeah. But it was it was awesome. And one tip I would say to people is 
you really have to let go of the things that you're not very attached to. And then when you are very attached, then you have to convince the other people that this is important. So you kind of learn, I guess, pick your battles yeah. when it comes to this type of thing. The same with um, Ewan and I with The Healthy Writer, because he's a, a medical doctor, writes for medical journals, his voice is so different to mine. And, and I had one idea of what I thought the book was gonna be, and it ended up being quite different because I adjusted to his style. So that's one big tip for collaboration sure someone has to be the leader but you do have to really collaboration is about letting go of ego and coming up with a better product in the end yeah and that's a really great thing to do I remember thinking when Jay was talking about it that um you know old-fashioned word is to call it teamwork and uh, and there's a reason why it's a bit of a cliche in the military and in the corporate world of teamwork building exercises and all the rest of it and there's a real reason behind that because it's the kind of the essence to getting stuff done and not just in corporate or military life in your family life and with your friends and stuff it's a really um really important part of being a human being i think and existing Yes, although I think writers, part of the reason we write is we don't necessarily like all that. And in fact, when I worked in the corporate life, I used to get feedback like, you're not really a team player, are you? You know, <laughs> and I'm like, no, actually, I'm not. I'm more of a lone wolf. I'm like a Jack Reacher is, is a lone wolf character. And I love those bits in uh, the Lee Child books. But it's... Um, so I think that becomes the difficulty is, yes, I'm a lone wolf. Yes, I create. How can I bring my strengths to this other person's strengths and create something that is even better? Um, and I've, I've been very blessed working with Jay. I've co-written now three books with Jay Thorne uh, and he's brilliant because he's so adaptable because he's worked in music. He's a musician and I think authors don't get it as well as musicians but what I'm looking at now I'm working on a screenplay for Map of Shadows because I think because of the lessons I've learned around co-writing collaboration because screenwriting and film uh, you know is a much more collaborative process you can't do it on your own whereas indie authors so we can do everything on our own now but it's very good to kind of think well what can I do more with more of us and of course you guys do that at uh, SPF you know you're not just um, Mark or James or John you're you're to, or Lucy yep. <laughs> you're together you know yes yeah absolutely I mean I'm I think I probably am a team player I think it's a need for me to want to be in a team it's interesting how personalities are so different um, between different people I, I would I, I'm I would be a very bad lone wolf assassin I'd want a couple of people <laughs> with me Oh, I'd be great. <laughs> yeah, you'd be good. Cold-blooded, just go. Okay, um, so that's kind of catching up a little bit with where you are. So quite a lot of writing. I mean, the book production's been uh, a bit of a focus of yours. Um, and you are a bit of a polymath. Is that, that, that fair? You've got oh, quite a few yeah, strings to your I mean, bow. Definitely. And it's funny because you say I, I did eight books last year, which is the most I've done ever. I mean, and five of those were co-written. So very it was a big year production wise. And what's so interesting is right now I'm doing the screenplay partially because I feel a little burned out by writing books. And I think that's that's been a really interesting learning for me because I haven't been a high production person and I wouldn't have done um, eight without co-writing. But when you're doing eight different projects, as well as all the rest of the stuff we do, podcasting, speaking, traveling, life, um, you know, I realized last year a lot more about how that some indie authors have become quite burned out with this with this production process. So part of the reason to do to move into doing a screenplay adaptation, first thing of Map of Shadows, my latest novel, is to give myself almost a break from the book production process because it's so different. So I'm really, and I'm loving it. I'm so energized by learning something new, by using the same story because I love my story. You know, I'm still in love with the book, but I'm I'm not really ready to write another novel. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a, a really interesting process, but I feel like Last year was a big year for my own development and co-writing has been a big part of that, moving into romance, which I never expected to happen. Uh, and yeah, so it has been a big year and big year for production. This year will probably be just as big, but I also want to do a couple of screenplays and start the adaptation process too. Um, was the focus on production last year, what was driving that? Was it commercial? No, not at all. <laughs> I, although I'm a businesswoman, I'm very proud of it. Uh, and I, 
my writing, I don't have a production schedule really. I, I know what the next book will be, but I don't have a whole year's worth of production. Um, my mum and me ended up doing three three novels, Sweet Romance, basically because my mum is now retired and she loves writing. So she turned into a nutter writer. Right. <laughs> so I was like, okay, mum, you know, whatever, we'll, we'll do it. So I did a lot of work with her, um, but also, the healthy writer was not planned at all it was not on my 2017 plan and then you and pitched me with the idea so that was a surprise um map of shadows was probably the only book i had i had planned so it's quite interesting how some writers are very organized around these these, these are the books i'm going to write for the next x years for me i kind of have this rolling um hierarchy in my files on my computer which is the next book and i move things in and out of the next book um, for each author name, depending on how I'm feeling. Uh, and also, I guess, depending on the promise to the reader. So I have to write another arcane novel, arcane number 10, which will be set between New Orleans and San Francisco. And I've got the kind of, I've written the notes on the plot, I kind of know what it's going to be, but that, I, that has to be my next novel. Uh, and yeah, I'm not quite sure on the others, but I, I, I think it's very important when you're doing this full time to make sure that you're listening to the muse. And I'm very much driven by the muse, especially for JF Penn, my thriller name. Uh, I can't, I don't write to market um, for JF Penn at all. Uh, I, I think that would, I just would have to go back to the day job <laughs> that for, for me. So no, I have to love it basically. You don't want it to feel too much like work at any point. No, and in fact, this has been another big thing for me. I've really changed my focus. Anything that is considered work or like feels like work, I'm trying to outsource as much as possible. So that's another reason I'm able to create more and was able to create more last year. And why this year I'm getting a lot better at saying no. So I'm doing very few speaking engagements this year. I did quite a few last year. And although I love it, it's work, it really is hard. I find it so hard and it tires me out. And this is part of the introvert thing, obviously. So I'm doing a couple of conferences this year. I'll be at NINC, I think you'll be at NINC as yes. well. Yep. Yeah, but that to me will be hopefully less work and more engagement with other authors and things like that. But I, I think we have to be very sensitive, whether you're, you know, for the listeners, whether you're doing this full time or whether you want to do this full time, you have to run the business of being a writer. And then you have to look at the creative side, but you have to make sure that you don't turn this into another day job. Otherwise, what is the point? <laughs> so I've instituted weekends, which is new for me. Yeah. <laughs> Something that I learned from the healthy writer, because another thing that happened with the kind of burnout is it's because I work so hard and it's like, okay, well, how do I balance working hard, but working hard on the things that really matter to me, which is building a body of work that I'm proud of over the long term. Uh, because I'm lucky enough now to be, you know, financially secure in many ways. And so I'm really focused on how can I make this the best creative life, focus on creating the best creative work and spending my time doing stuff I love. Yeah. Um, that's brilliant. I mean, I, we had Kitty Buholtz on recently to talk about time management and um, reflecting on some of the things she was saying. I think I worked out that I'm working more hours and taking less leave than I've ever done in my life. And yet most of my friends yes. look at me and slightly take the mickey because they're trudging off to get a train in the morning and they say, oh yeah, what time did you get up today? And you know, how was your afternoon nap? And so on. And you know, they, they'll never listen to me. They have no idea how much work goes on at the moment. Well, and that's the thing. And but at the end of the day, we are our own boss. I mean, you have it slightly worse because, of course, you have a Dawson. whole team. Yeah, you have both Dawsons. Yeah. Um, was, <laughs> you know, I, I, I am the boss uh, here. There's me and my husband, but I'm pretty much the boss. <laughs> so, if, you know, if I decide on a new project, I mean, I've, I, I'm very ambitious, as you know, I've talked about this before. And I always, you know, I am ambitious, but I'm creatively ambitious more than anything now. Like, you know, I, I really do want to win a literary prize. I do want to be on the lists of top authors. I do want a film made. I do want, I'd love to win an Oscar for a screenplay. Hell, you know, hell yeah. I mean, I have those ambitions but how 
how, and that part of the healthy writer is, how can we achieve our creative ambitions while still looking after our physical and mental health? Because you're not enjoying the journey unless you are happy along the way. And as you say, actually, I've worked harder over the last, you know, since I left my job in 2011. And I guess before that, I was doing both jobs, doing both at the same time. But yeah, sure, absolutely. You have to work damn hard when you're starting a new business. But at some point, you have to move into a more maintenance mode of, okay, well, is it worth cranking this out for the next 10 grand or the next 50 grand or 100 grand? Or am I actually really happy? <laughs> and what's so great, like I was at yoga earlier because I now have instituted, um, this is another big shift and I'll bring this up around um, t- the phrase time management, I've started to have a problem with mm-hmm. in the same way as diet and exercise, because these words tend to have quite a negative connotation and that they feel like punishment. So what I've started to kind of reframe it as is instead of diet, it's just nice food, food that makes you, your body feel good, not necessarily your taste buds, but your body. And then um, instead of exercise, thinking about movement. So every day now I move, I do movement, and that might be yoga or a walk or a really long walk or something like that. And for food, it's yay, I love healthy food that makes me feel good. And I have portions for the size of the woman I am. or the woman I'd like to be. And by, and also time management, it's okay, not how do I fit more in the day? And I could fit more in the day if I didn't do a two hour yoga class, let's face it. But how do I fit more of what's important in my life? So, uh, you know, on the wall, I have all these different things. And one of the main thing is create a body of work I'm proud of. And I wrote that years ago, but that body of work is also includes our body. Mm-hmm our physical bodies. And so often as writers, we concentrate on our brain as the most important thing, but actually the body is not just something that carries around a brain. (laughs) It's the best brain hacker and the best way to make your brain work better is to deal with your physical health. So I've been having these real come to Jesus moments around these issues you can tell in the last, uh, in the last year. And One of the results of that is The Healthy Writer, the book. So let's talk a little bit about that. Sounds like it grew organically as an idea from you rather than you sitting down thinking, I'm going to do a self-help group, a self-help book or whatever you might want to categorize it as. So um, tell us about the collaboration as well, Ewan. Yes, so uh, Dr. Ewan Lawson, he's a British author, and in fact, it was his idea. So um, I spoke in November 2016 in London, at an event in London, Ewan was in the audience. And then over the January, he heard me talk about wanting to become a healthier writer. And he emailed me and pitched the book. Now. I've, I get, obviously, we all get pitches every day. And do we listen to most of them? (laughs) I mean, no, we don't, because, you know, a lot of them are not a good fit. But I read this and I remembered you and from the event and I was like, okay, this is interesting. And so I actually set him a task. I said, well, you know, write me a chapter and I'll see because this is quite a big deal because I knew that I would be doing a lot of the marketing. I have an audience. He doesn't. He's a GP, a British GP. So um, I, he did the chapter and then we started to brainstorm table of contents and then I just went, yep, yeah, we can do this. And then probably the big turning point when I decided, okay, I'll start talking about this in public is when we did the survey. So we did a survey of over 1100 writers um, on the podcast and on the blog. And well, the survey was for more people. That's how many people responded. And the it was incredible how much physical pain and mental health issues there is in the author community, ranging from, you know, back pain, neck pain, arm, RSI, headaches, migraine, eye strain, to mental health issues like depression, anxiety, loneliness, which is so sad, um, as well as being overweight. Let's just get it out there because of the sedentary lifestyle that we end up doing. And people who are sitting at their desks writing for sort of 10 hours a day and sometimes more than that. And then people who are who have essentially broken their bodies on this wheel of writing. So through doing that, we split the book into two halves. So the unhealthy writer, all the things that can go wrong, and then the healthy writer, how you can fix it and how you can make your physical health much better. Yeah, um, I, you know, this whole area is going to resonate, I think, a lot with uh, with people listening, and it comes up um, time and time again in interviews. I mean, I've I also suffered from when I 
it was a BBC report. I was out and about a lot and then got a job in the BBFC in London, which was very sedentary. And uh, I had the worst back pain I've ever had. And it, it was funny how I just thought, oh, it's a stage of life. I've suddenly got into my 40s and I've got back pain. And it was entirely to do with sitting down all day. So I came away from that job after seven years. I now have a sit-stand desk and uh, walk like you. I sort of I have a dog as well. So I go walking as much as possible and a little bit of exercise. I, I literally don't have that. That pain comes when I've been stupid and picked something heavy up without stretching you know, doing it properly. Um, and that was a bit of a surprise to me. And I think how many people go to work and sit down all day? I mean, that just that one thing has made a tremendous difference to me. Mm, and we're both right now standing up yeah. as we're, we're doing this interview. And I, I've got, um, you know, obviously in the book we talk about it, I've got some photos coming on the on the blog soon of my setup and Ewan's setup. And, and at, you're right, it makes such a huge difference to have a sit stand. I think going to 100% standing can also be bad, mm -hmm. but I also have a Swiss ball. Um, you know, you have a, a laptop stand, you know, a separate keyboard. There's just a number of things that you can put in place that can really help you. And then I think also taking breaks, What's so funny, um, I remember in the book, Ewan was like, yeah, you can take breaks from your computer, but are you taking a break with your phone? Yeah. <laughs> so are you walking away from your computer going, I'm having a break now, and are you then spending 10 minutes looking at like Facebook on your phone or whatever? So th these are the types of things to, to think about. But again, as you say, many people are at the point of really quite crippling pain. Um, and what I would say to people is you can reverse the situation. So some of my own, um, my own personal chapters, so I have some very personal chapters in the book. Uh, one is about my kind of five year journey of back pain. At one point I was in hospital with suspected spinal tumors. It was so bad, you know, I was in the whole scanner and, and I didn't have it. And then over a process of years, uh, basically now it's, I'm fine and I do yoga and I walk and I stand and but you have to do all these maintenance activities it's a bit like writing you can't just write once and that's it for the rest of your life you actually have to do this you, you know use your body every day which is why I find yoga now really good um, so that I think that's really important is that it's a, a consistent uh, journey over time the other thing I talk about is um, my letter to sugar which has resonated with a lot of people which uh, basically last year i I self-diagnosed myself as an addict <laughs> and my behavior was as an addict and I was very unhappy with that. It wasn't just the weight gain from sugar, it's the link with Alzheimer's is the biggest scare for me. Um, when Terry Pratchett died, um, you know, wonderful British fantasy writer uh, of Alzheimer's, it, it's my biggest fear. I'm not scared of dying, I'm scared of Alzheimer's and dementia. And the link with sugar is been proven, you know, lots, there's lots of resources about that. So I was like, okay, I really want to give up sugar, but I am an addict, how am I going to do this? So I went, um, I had some psychotherapy, but I, it was the main thing was, I made the decision and that letter to sugar I basically say this is why I have to stop this um yeah so it's been it's been a real journey for me actually and I'm still just so people know I'm not a paragon of health at this point no I, I'm interested <laughs> to know how much sugar when you say you've cut sugar you've cut it out of your coffee and you perhaps don't eat Mars bars or is it completely is there literally no <laughs> well, no, I mean, as in, I drink black coffee, so I don't have milk, which is sugar. Um, I... I've got to cut out milk as well. No, no, not, and you don't have to. I'm just saying, oh, I'm, there I'm are addicted things... to sugar. It's also the behavioural thing. So, for example, if I have milk in coffee, it makes it actually does give you a slightly sweet taste. That then I feel like I should have a cake with it. Right. <laughs> Whereas if I have black coffee and I switched to black coffee, it only took a few days to kind of get over how horrible it was, and now I love it. Um, but it was that, that's one behavioural habit, and that, that's another thing. So I now have been looking at habits a lot more, and. So the habit of, so I write in a cafe, for example, and what I've done is move around the corner so I can't see the cake cabinet. Mm -hmm. I like it. <laughs> it. You know, I'm an addict. You know, it means I, I still want it. And what's so interesting, uh, things like, um, oh, I just, I've just changed my taste buds over a period of time. I, I will still occasionally have some sugar, but I, it, I don't actually really like it anymore. I haven't had chocolate for ages. I've changed my, you know, uh, stance on red meat and vegetables and and i think that's the other thing you have to think about your health as a like layers of an onion so right now people listening like what is the number one thing that is wrong with your body like whatever that is so say it is 
back pain. So then the first thing to do is start doing the things to sort out the back pain. So for me, like I said, it was a five year journey of sorting that out. And then last year it was, okay, now I'm ready to tackle my weight and my eating habits. So then I look at that and then, um, or headaches or migraine, like what, or loneliness. How do we tackle each of these things in turn to make our life holistically better? And because this is the thing, you know, we, we don't have a long life. No. So let's make the best of it, both in our writing and creativity and also in our health and well-being. Yeah. And uh, I think that's my biggest motivator in this area is the old John Lennon phrase that life's something that happens while you're making other plans. And where I am now with the kids growing up, it's exactly what it feels like. I can feel the years slipping away. The kids have gone from three and five year olds, uh, young teenagers now, and they'll be gone. It's a funny mm -hmm. thing. We were thinking about doing some work on the house for more space. And Jill and I looked at each other and thought, well, it's going to take kind of a year to get this done. And what are we actually doing this for? They're going to be at university and gone in three years time. And that's frightening to me. So I want to be living now. I want to be enjoying now. So I'm going to talk to Dawson. And that's uh, my- Yeah, <laughs> well, this is the thing. I mean, you. I think you have to decide on your priorities. And uh, around my movement, you know, up until, I mean, even since I saw you in November, I've made huge changes. And what it's been a little bit at a time, then some bigger bits, then some bigger bits. And it's it's quite surprising, but you have to kind of make that time in your schedule to go through the process. So at the moment with my movement aspects, uh, because I'm training for a double ultra marathon in March, I'm, I mean, I'm doing uh, probably 10 to, well, no, prob between 10 and 20 hours of movement a week. So, and my walks on a Sunday are six hours plus. So, and I used to feel what a waste of time. I should be writing. Why am I being lazy? I should be working harder. Yeah. But the thing is, if you read productivity books, what they'll say is the most productive people in the world, whether they are productive in our sense of numbers of words on the page, you know, people like Richard Branson, for example, spend a lot of time doing exercise and movement and having fun. You know, mm. he loves windsurfing, um, you know, this type of thing. Like I went ice skating for the first time in 30 years and I loved it. So I hope I hope that this message, because I feel like with the indie movement that we've, we've been in this phase of high production focus that is just not sustainable. It's not. And we have to look at how do we have a quality of life that involves creativity and health so that we can do this for longer and not completely burn out. And if that means we have to look at different forms of income, then that's what we should do. Because yeah, again, what's the point? <laughs> yeah. So you, the, the changes you've made, Joe, how easy is it to make them stick? Well, that's why um, I think you need to peel the onion because you don't, I've tried, for example, yoga. I tried yoga loads over the last 10 years. Uh, you know, I've really, I've been to retreats and I've gone to classes and it's never stuck until I found a school here and in Bath where I live. And part of the reason for moving to Bath was because I also like to drink. <laughs> and in London, I was drinking too much. So by, mo by changing even physically your location, you can help to change your habits. Um, so so, and alcohol, of course, is tons of sugar. Yes. <laughs> so You haven't given up alcohol? Oh, no. Right. Not, no, of course not. <laughs> slightly but, scared um, then. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't. I, I'm trying to cut it down, obviously, yeah. but not, not, I haven't given it up. This is the other thing. I think the giving it up, this kind of negative, I haven't given up sugar. I'm choosing to eat differently. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that's another thing and it has to be a habit. But as I said, I last year in terms of my diet, which has been a real issue, um, was I saw a psychotherapist, as, no, sorry, a hypnotherapist. So he helped me with the the kind of input into our brains, um, hypnotherapy. And then, and now I have a physical health coach who's helping me with some of the emotional eating. So, you know, just being really out there with this. So many of us have emotional patterns around eating. So one of mine, and maybe some people listening will resonate with this, it's, I've been a good girl today. Mm -hmm. I've worked really hard at my job. 
I deserve a treat for working really hard. And, you know, maybe that's a curry and a half bottle of wine and a tiramisu. <laughs> and that's, and, but the thing is, I am a good girl and I do work really hard and I love my work, but I shouldn't, I'm not five. I don't need a treat every day. But I think that treat aspect, I'm sure a lot of writers listening will understand that. So I've changed that to, I'm a good girl. I deserve a treat. I'm going to yoga. Yeah. <laughs> because I really enjoy it and it makes me feel good so, and the feeling good is also something that's really shifted in me is I used to be how it feels in my mouth like a packet of Haribo's which is what broke me back in May last year is that was your low main, like yeah basically eating a whole one of those massive bags of Haribo's if people don't know what they are they're like those sour gummy sweets that are really just 100% sugar and that that made my mouth feel good and I got maybe a sugar rush and then I felt like crap. Um, my sleep was mixed up. I would wake up like sluggish, heavy, which is actually like a sugar hangover. Uh, you know, feeling that sort of insulin coma feeling in the morning. So, and when I stopped doing sugar, you know, at night, even fruit, my sleep was much better and I woke up perky like I am now. <laughs> um, so this is the thing. It's you, it's a bit like the Tim Tim Ferriss stuff. You know, you're an experiment. You are your own experiment. So what makes your body feel good? So I used a lot of trackers. So I, I have on my desk, um, I have an action log where I keep, you know, how did I sleep? How am I feeling? Um, for example, my coach said, get rid of the scales and we'll do centimeters instead. So, you know, centimeter measurements because I'm emotionally attached to the scales uh, and I need to break that. So I guess all in all, I don't wanna sound all preachy. I, I just feel like when you start looking at this aspect of your life, you start peeling away different layers and finding that you're maybe not as completely whole as you thought you were. Yeah. So, you know, other emotional things around food might be related to per parents and things that happened to us when we were kids. And hell, there's nothing wrong with a bit of therapy. <laughs> no, and I do, I do think, I don't know about you, but I think as I get older, that starts to manifest itself much more than it used to. I think in my 20s, I ignored everything. It didn't really matter. Now I'm in my 50s. I dwell, I do dwell on what happened to me as a kid. Nothing very bad happened to me as a kid, but we all have mm. things that, that we went through and that made me who I am. And there's little bits of resentment there and stuff. Stuff just comes up now that didn't used to. And that surprised me that it means more as I get older. I kind of thought it might be the other way around, actually. Yeah, well, and I think I was talking to someone about the pain aspect. So we tend to only tackle things in our life when we're in enough pain. And that's why that letter to sugar is so important to my journey, because it's the moment I went, OK, I'm in enough pain because I'm confident as a woman. You know, it wasn't that I was feeling unattractive. It was that my body was breaking. And as you say, that's partly an age thing, but it's it's partly a maturity thing of recognizing I want to live another 50 years mm. in a healthy way. I still want my brain to be as good when I die as as right now, yeah. uh, or better, obviously. Yes. So I think, yeah, and you're right about looking back and looking forward. And f it's so interesting now as well, just from a fiction, so let's take it from a writing point of view. Food is incredibly political in so many ways. And when you start becoming more aware of conversations around food and movement and what people say, uh, like I was around um, someone's house and the, the children's interactions with the parents, with the political aspect of what they will eat and what they won't. And it's so fascinating kind of watching this behavior around food Food, which I think just carries through into the rest of our life. You know, maybe you were like for me, like my mum didn't allow us to have sweets. And I went to school in Malawi in Africa and there was no chocolate. So for me, chocolate was like the ultimate like thing I really wanted because it wasn't even there. And then I was rebelling by having it. So it became an almost rebellious treat uh, and those things become so powerful so i urge people listening if you're still listening to my little rant um then um really look at your behavior around food and start writing these things down i've been doing a lot of nlp stuff neuro linguistic programming 
around food and language, the language I use around food and alcohol. I am actually tackling alcohol next right? because not because, you know, and I, I specifically said to my coach, I love alcohol. I'm not giving it up, mm-hmm. which might be a problem in itself. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, the, but the point was, what are the behaviors? What are the emotional things around alcohol? So one thing, and again, I'm just being honest, when I go to literary conferences as an indie author in Britain, I feel insecure and I feel that I'm not good enough and maybe other people feel this way but I then use alcohol as a way to make myself feel more confident so it helps me act more confident when I'm just feeling like I'm not uh, does that resonate yeah it it does and um, I think there's a positive role for for things like alcohol and I I enjoy my alcohol very much and I enjoy my beer and when I think about a night in the pub where I uh, would be less enthusiastic to the point of might not even go if it's the usual crowd and I'm not drinking for whatever reason but if I'm drinking it's a hugely enjoyable thing but when I think about what I enjoy about it it's the conversation it's that we sit down and we do that and the alcohol is part of that now I'm I don't know it, it I you know, you do see this kind of AA club in America where any sniff of it is uh, is seen as evil. But actually, for me, I'm quite happy to say it is a part and parcel of the way that I socialise and enjoy myself in the evening. And I'm quite pleased to hear you say, I enjoy it, so I'm not going to give that bit up. Yeah, and it's the same with the food. So I don't want people to think I'm not, you know, I'm... I, what's so interesting is like I'm having pasta for dinner so I've changed and I wasn't eating pasta because I was like trying to lose weight so my whole orientation around food is like I said it's not diet it's food that makes you feel good and yeah a, a glass of wine or two does make me me happy and feel good um, it's more that it's addressing and this will be individual to to, to people listening there will be different things that are your triggers that are your the things that you just feel need some help and you know what are those things and what are the things you want for your future or for your kids or you know other things you want to deal with in yourself so that you can be a better role model um and it's so funny because i've resisted talking about this stuff for years I've, I've actually always used this example of i talk about writing on my site i don't talk about weight loss <laughs> And now I find myself talking about this, but only in a, in a, I guess a real realization and a sharing the journey because I want us to continue. And just circling right back round to that burnout that we're seeing in the community, uh, which obviously you guys are seeing too, because you've had people on to talk about it. Um, that's something that we can address for ourselves by taking stock and one another thing I've done like a real practical thing that I've done is I've now scheduled the whole of 2018 I've scheduled um, every month a week when I don't have any appointments Mm -hmm. and every quarter two weeks and then I've scheduled the whole of December Um, and that means yeah sure I'll do some work but it will be my work it won't be getting on a podcast it won't be you know speaking and I've scheduled that whole year so that I know that I will have more headspace more time and I will say no more because I just can't fit stuff in so that's a real challenge to people look at how do you make sure that you're going to stick to these things because another thing on food I fall off my I guess my well-being I'm trying to use the right language because it's so important you know it's not falling off the wagon it's like I feel worse if I work really hard so say I get you know I'm up at six and I'm writing and then I have a late webinar or something and and then I'm I'm broken I'm too tired so by scheduling that time I enable myself to stick to a lifestyle that I I think is healthier so those are some things just be more self-aware about your physical behavior behavior yeah that's really good I realize I shouldn't sound glib about people who have a genuine alcohol addiction by the way and for whom a sniff is um, a potentially very bad news for them and that wasn't the point I was making I was clumsy um, no I, I, I this is great Joe and uh, I've been trying to go back to work nine day fortnights in the last couple of jobs that I did the BBC and BBFC and obviously they made you work longer hours uh, to put up with that but I you know I did a 14 hour day yesterday in the middle of a course creation um, in this office which is not particularly healthy so the nine day fortnight is every other Friday I'm going to try and not work just take that day off and go to the cinema I've bought my cinema pass for the year so I'm 
I think I think it's it's a bit zeitgeisty. I think a lot of people are coming to this this probably because of where we are, as you say, in the in what is still a young industry, this indie mm-hmm. uh, writing industry. I want to talk to you just a little bit about the book itself. So, how have you structured this? I mean, how accessible is this? Is it um, you know, you say it's alternate chapters and so on. Is some is there a formula people follow? Is it a series of advice? Has it done? Well, it's basically in, um, first of all, we do start with seven reasons why writing is great for you, because there is no message here that you should give up writing. It's just you need to change your practices around it. Then we go into part one, which is the unhealthy writer, in order to make you feel like you're not alone. So we include a lot of quotes from writers who did the survey about the pain, different types of pain they're in, um, the things they're suffering from, so that you feel like, okay, I've got eye strain, or I am lonely, or I have mental health issues, or you know, these, or I am feeling like I'm sedentary and overweight. Like we go into all the different problems that you might have, and then the idea is you can dip in the chapters or IBS. So IBS is very common anxiety, so it's irritable bowel syndrome. Let's talk about poo. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> um, you know, but this, these are the things we really do get into it. And then in part two, we have the healthy writer and and we basically you know how to improve your sleep how to improve your workplace how to improve improve your diet um you know how to make friends how to build a community i wrote that chapter uh, because it's so important and i remember when i started writing i was living in australia i was working in a corporate job i didn't know any creatives or any authors and there will be people listening who feel like that now but there are ways that you can attract and build and grow a community or you know find author friends and that's really important so there is a prescriptive well it's not prescriptive you get to dip in and choose what you want but we have you know specific tips you know like a chapter on the practicalities of the standing desk or um, dictation I have a whole chapter on dictation which is something that a lot of authors are are moving to um, which actually it's amazing if you do an hour of dictation you will not be tired whereas if you do an hour typing 5,000 words, which is hard enough in itself, then you will be tired. So it's a very interesting physical difference between dictation and typing. So it's basically structured that way. And in terms of you and and I, I wrote the more personal chapters. So really kind of spilling the beans on like the problems that we've had in in our family with with IBS and anxiety. And then, you know, my sugar chapter, um, walking, yoga, all of those things. So, and then Ewan brings the medical specialism. He is a doctor and he also um, is an editor on the British Medical Journal. So he brings the evidence-based practice to things. Uh, And that's so important. I couldn't write this book without a doctor because I'm not a doctor so that's really important and uh, although it was funny because of course I edited Ewan's chapters and I had to make him tone down the medical stuff Mm. I was like this is not a medical journal this is a load of authors so he he actually ended up moving to dictation to let his real voice come through his human voice as opposed to his you know very well mannered doctor voice uh so i think it worked uh, really well and we've had a lot of good feedback we are also about to do an audiobook so this is interesting because each chapter has a clear voice whether it's you and or me and he's a man um then we have two audiobook narrators because we just couldn't work out how to do it otherwise so we're going to have a man narrate his and a woman narrate mine um so that's going to be coming out in the next month or so um and it'll be interesting because i haven't i haven't really i don't really know how that's going to work no. but we couldn't do it any other way i bet it's been great for you and it must have been a great journey of discovery for him about writing especially with you editing yes. and feeding back to him yeah, well, he's uh, he's really keen to move more into, um, you know, helping more people online as well. So he's now doing the healthy bloke, uh, you know, and uh, he's, yeah, he's learned a lot in the process. He's also in the crime writing community. So those uh, thriller writers, crime writers in the UK may well see him around. <laughs> I bet the autopsy scenes are good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, um, but no, I, it's... Uh, yeah, I feel that this is for me. And so often with nonfiction, I write the book I need I need for myself. So when I wrote The Successful Author Mindset, it was because I was feeling massively chronic self-doubt about my life as a writer. And that book helped me understand the mindset. And this book has started my health journey. So again, it's thinking, 
this is going to take the rest of your life in the same mm. way as becoming a writer it takes the rest of your life yeah. uh, and that's what's fun about it so yeah i feel like it's be it, even if nobody else is helped by this book then i feel like my life has been changed and i'll probably live a lot longer because of it which is awesome well that <laughs> is in itself a, a grand prize to have from writing a book but i'm sure it's going to help lots of people where can people find it joe uh, so it's on all the usual online uh, stores or if you come over to the Creative Pen on the books page, you'll find all the links there. And also I, t I sell direct as well. So moving into that. Um, but yeah, it's on, on all the stores, ebook, print and soon to be in audio as well. And it works well on ebook. Is, there, is it uh, diagram heavy or it's not? No, there's no, no diagrams. Okay, yeah. uh, it's just a text-based book. No, it's not like move this way or yeah. whatever. It's 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 <laughs> it's more about finding your your own path with with some of the suggestions. So yeah, I really hope that some people might check it out and give it a go. And some of the chapters are appearing on the Creative Pen as well, so you can uh, always get some of it for free. Joe, thank you. You um. Yeah, I think one of the, the interesting things about you is you make a lot of this look easy. And when you speak <laughs> and we listen to what you say, you realise that for you, a lot of it is quite a struggle. And uh, I always remember I saw you speaking in front of 400 odd people at a conference in December. And in the middle of this very articulate, very self-confident uh, talk, you revealed that you're an introvert, which you, I know is something you, you talk about quite often. And I think a lot of people would think, really are you because you don't look like one you know standing up on a stage in front of 400 people but uh it's almost inspiring to see you you almost like those challenges and you will overcome them um but you also make it look easy well, i'm sure it's not oh well thank you thank you i mean part of the reason i started the creative pen was to share my journey along the way and some of those chapters in the healthy writer are some of the most honest things i've ever shared in public like you know i want to give up sugar because i want to look happy naked in front of my husband now i think people listening will resonate with that and being able to say these things write these things that's what helps other people. So whatever you're struggling with, you know, people listening, if you can write about it, if you can share it, your journey, you're going to help others. And it was so funny at that conference that you mentioned, Youpreneur, I said that and the number of people who came to me, who emailed me and said, it, I needed to hear that you can still be successful when you're an introvert. Um, and that conference was full of seem seemingly extrovert presenters, right? And yes. it was, it's so interesting when you start sharing honestly, you change people's lives. And I think we are, again, we're at this, we a part of the indie way and part of what you guys have done is sharing the journey, sharing income reports, sharing secrets, you know, all these things we, we can share and we can help other people. So it's certainly not not easy, but it's it's brilliant. You know, the journey is the point. Yes. <laughs> you know, I think that's the thing with exercise and movement as well as writing. The journey is the point. When we finish a book, that's not the end it, you know yeah. we move on to the next one so thank you so much for saying that I appreciate it and I'll, I will continue sharing <laughs> yeah I'm sure you will Joe thank you so much indeed for coming on oh thanks for having me so Mark I know you like your little walks don't you mm-hmm I do yeah I usually I try and I try and do 10,000 steps a day right so that's um that's a reasonable amount you, that you have to consciously go and do that. It's not something that will just kind of toss up by itself. And I, I try at least twice a week, although I have been quite bad this week just for, because I'm so busy as, as, as you are too, but um, I will usually go for a kind of a lunchtime walk. It takes about 45 minutes to walk around Salisbury, which is a really beautiful um, town. And there's some you know, lovely, um, a lovely area that I walk around. Um, and that will usually give me the 10,000 steps. And then um, at, at the, at the weekend, um, I'll try and run a couple of times. So I'll usually run Saturday and Sunday morning. And that's it's one of the things I find very difficult at the moment because we are so busy um, and um, it's quite hard to find. And, it's, and obviously it's winter in the UK at the moment. So it's very dark early in the you know, until quite late in the morning. And it gets dark soon as well. So I, I leave the house when it's dark and I come home when it's dark and there are the children to worry about. So I find it very, very difficult to find a time to, to run um so you know when i lived in london it would be different i could run at any time because the streets are lit um where i where i live now there is no lighting so um i could you know i could run around the fields but i would almost certainly fall over and break my leg or something so i can't do that so it is very difficult to find the time so 
one of the things that I'm doing with this move I will try and I think work from home a little bit more often in the winter time so that I can I'll probably have a treadmill um, and, and and that kind of stuff so I'll be able to be a bit more active I know that it's important and I, I start to get a little bit uncomfortable when I don't exercise so yeah I need to need to make a bigger effort I think as we as we push on through the year yeah and as Joe says it, it is about thinking you know what what do you want to do um and uh, it is you have you are a busy stage of life I mean I think having children at the age they are and I you know one of my best friends is in in London his children are about the same age as yours and I stay with them occasionally and you know it reminds me of the manic nature of life when they're that old and my kids are now 14 and uh, William's 12 tomorrow in fact uh and it's different. You know, they look after themselves. So our job is actually to try and get them to be manic, get them off the iPads and, and outside. It's the other way around. Whereas, you you know, you, if the house is in chaos and the kids are shouting and you change into your gear and go running, it feels, I mean, I can remember that. And Jill looking at me thinking, well, I hope you're enjoying yourself. <laughs> you know, yes, so there's a, I know. There's a, there's a bit of that as yeah. well. Um, good. And I, I I was reflecting also on on talking to Joe. And it's interesting because, you know, we, we bump into each other quite often and, uh, uh, and I, I and I do sense from Joe that she's and she said it in the interview that she's thinking, what do I want to do? If I don't want to do, if it feels like work, I'm not going to do it, or I'm going to really down prioritize it. And um, there's a part of me, I think, uh, maybe a male thing or British thing, I don't know, where you sort of feel a bit guilty about enjoying yourself and not working. And I think it's brought up by post Second World War austere period parents who really said, you know, drove the work ethic into us. But there's a balance between working and doing stuff that is killing you and you don't want to you're not enjoying um i don't know if i could ever get to the point where joe is where she's really winding some things down in her life to reprioritize herself yeah i know what you mean about that i i, I find well i love i love what i do so i i don't find working to be a chore and i remember what it was like when i was a lawyer and then also also to an extent when we were working where we were where we met i that was generally a nice job, but there were moments that I would kill, want to kill people. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't get that now. I love everything. I love, I love writing. I love the SPF stuff. Um, it's, it's not something I'm kind of paid to do something I love, which is, I know it's very, very fortunate and we're all lucky to be in that situation. So I, I wouldn't, I would also get quite guilty. I and mean, I live, I, I work very close to the cinema in Salisbury. And when I was at the BBFC, I'd often go and just sit in the cinema in my lunch break to watch another film yeah um it was it'd be much easier for me to do it now because i don't have to pretend i don't have to kind of sneak out and, and pretend that i didn't just take a two-hour lunch break um but i don't i i just i haven't i haven't been in the cinema this year i only really went maybe five times last year probably less than that um because i i do sit in there thinking like well what should i really be doing i should yes. be writing i you know goodness i've only done two thousand words today yeah. Um, and I haven't done that's, the podcast that, and, you know. that's, it's a crippling mentality that we need to get uh, rid of in fact I had the same conversation with John Dyer and he said and he said exactly the same I've been sort of I'm fed up feeling guilty when I'm enjoying myself and the cinema's a good example I, I feel exactly the same but I'm trying to get over that and uh, I've actually bought myself a pass at my local cinema it's sort of 17 you know, 20 dollars a month or so and uh, you get unlimited access to the films. And this is a good time of year to go and see films. Where there's some really cracking films out there. So Three Billboards, yeah. Outside Ebbing, Missouri is in the cinema, Darkest Hour. Mm-hmm. I've seen Molly's Game already this year, which is the Aaron Sorkin directed and written film, where he's toned down a little bit the quickfire conversations, I noticed. Probably probably done enough of that in his, uh, his career now. But anyway, so yeah, there you go. Trying to balance things. Really good advice from uh, from Joe and read the book. It's got a bit of Joe in it and a bit of science in it from the GP um, uh, who wrote it, co-wrote it with her. Um, it's always, always a delight to speak to her. It's a kind of energizing experience. Um, I really think she's a fantastic member of our community and I'm uh, I'm very pleased that we're close, close to her here at yeah, SPF. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Okay. Look, that's it for this week. I'm just going to remind you that we're going to try and raise some money for one of our members of the SPF community who needs our help. That's uh, Tommy Don Bavan. So the URL that we uh, we made up on the spot that John Dyer is going to be creating in the next few minutes is selfpublishingformula.com forward slash Tommy. Go there. If you can give $5 or $50 or $1,000, you know, any amount is going to help. And we're going to uh, be donating on your behalf as well from SPF. Good. Mark, thank you very much. Good luck with your exchange of contracts. So I think traditionally happens at 2 p.m. or something, doesn't it? Or... Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it could happen any time, really. So, yes, yeah, so thank you for that. And then um, 
in the next couple of weeks, I will probably have less hair. I'll look older. <laughs> so well, you won't have less hair there. That'll I'll have back. more hair there. No, this is yeah. starting to be quite quite something now. Yes, you just need the cat on your lap. Good. Okay, look, have a lovely weekend. Good luck with that. And we'll speak to you guys next week. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.